Episode 66 of the Interpretation Station is called to order. Welcome everybody, this is an episode for my uh, Russian followers. Um, bit of an unusual episode today. So, uh, there's, we're not actually going to be doing a specific text today, uh, but we're rather going to be looking at a coping mechanism, coping strategies for a structure of the Russian language that tends to often pose problems, no matter what level we are, if we're sort of even beginners, even people with more a lot more experience. I mean, I've got quite a lot of experience now, and this is a structure that constantly poses problems. Um, and it's fairly unique, I guess, to the Slavic languages when interpreting into English. It's those times, it's those sentences that begin with verbs. When the rush them, the speaker just starts immediately with a verb. And that has a tendency to rather unsettle us as native English speakers. We English speakers... We like to have that noun up front, the subject of the sentence. We like to know what the you know who is the, the the main actor in the in the sentence coming up. But when we hear that the verb, the action coming out first, we kind of all like what's going on here. What's going on here? And it's important that we don't let that uh, fluster us too much, and that we have some idea of how to to cope with that, how to keep and keep the uh, the English sentence that um, that we give so that it still sounds reasonably uh, natural sounding in English. And that's something I've actually given a lot of thought to. And the um, the solutions I'm going to give you today, is, it's far from definitive. I've just thought I would start to, to look at it today. I may have to make a follow-up episode further on down the line, perhaps once I've collected a bit more data, shall we say. But I think it's useful to start, even now, looking at some examples, looking at some of the most common pitfalls, and think about ideas of how we might, you know, at least, you know, uh, deal with those sentences, to look at the best ways of approaching those structures, and also, you know, in the in the event that you're in real big trouble, you know, mech, uh, strategies for you know for as they say in French, sauver le meuble, sauver le meuble. Uh, you know, la basically uh, last gasp, last ditch sort of effort to try and um, save the day. How you can sort of try and mend the damage if things are going really if things are going badly wrong. Okay, so. I've decided to try and group these uh, examples uh, into sort of four very rough uh, groups, although it's really very hard to categorize. There's lots of overlaps uh, with the examples uh, I'm going to give, but uh, we'll give it a try anyway. So I'm going to be using, also, you know, showing you, giving you concrete examples of sentences looking at ideas for how we could perhaps deal with them. And uh, as I say, they're not going to be any definitive concrete answers, but I think it will at least be useful to you to, to th you know, that we've had a th have a think to sort of try and sort of flesh some of these examples out so that when you encounter them uh, on the job, you might at least have some idea of how to sort of find a, a solution. Okay, so... I've decided to uh, set the lesson out as follows. These are the sort of five groups I'm going to be looking at. So the five, so the five categories I'll be looking at. I've, I've sort of arranged it, I think, from the easiest kind to the the hardest, um, and then uh, at the end, I'm going to also just give you some general uh, tips. That, as I say, if you're really in a panic to give you at least a couple of things to hold on to, a couple of other sort of signposts that you may detect during a statement that will give you some idea as to, uh, how, as to how to handle these kinds of sentences. So the first group of this kind of sentence that I'm going to look at is to do with... Uh, these are quite frequent verbs that often come at the start of sentences 
just two specific verbs I'm going to look at, okay? Vizivayet uh, and nabudayetso. So now these, for me, are the sort of two easiest uh, verb sentence starters, if you like, to deal with, okay? Because they, they used a lot, especially vizivayet. Okay, because the Russians will often crack into a sentence with expressions like Vizivaita be spokoina srazviti is situatsi fusionum sudani. Vizivait udivieni sto autorita clada ranche nizadali at the pros. So these are this Vizivait, it's like to do with often it's to do with an emotion. To do, okay, uh, so the sort of safest way. There's two. There's two as. There's two real ways of sort of handling this for me. Um, if you really want to play safe, uh, you start off with saying so. For example, visivat uh, You just say a cause for concern is. Like I say, this is this is a an opener that they use frequently. The Russians, okay. A cause for concern is, or a source of concern is, and you can you can apply that also to um, a source of surprise is, or they sometimes say Okay, a source of satisfaction is. So that's it's quite a straightforward one uh, to do that one. As I said, it's usually to do with emotion, and you just put it. You just start off with a source of or a cause of. Certainly, when it's a visivat abyspakoinus, I tend to just really just go every time a cause a cause for concern is whatever uh, it may be. Um, now, also with this, it not, often tends to. The, the cause of concern often tends to apply uh, to the speaker, and I must so again. I'm always always tell you to be wary of immediately going uh, for the we. Uh, although with these kinds of things, like four times out of five, is probably going uh, to be a we as well. I often, for example, I'll often say we are troubled by the fact that, or we are concerned that. Uh, we are satisfied. We are pleased that that is the, the that's the formula that you can most readily uh, take the we. And now, if you play, if you've played safe, so you've say you've said a cause for concern or a source of concern, um, and you see then very quickly. So you've played it very safe. You've just said a source, a cause for concern, and you see very quickly as the sentence develops that. He, the speaker is really talking about us, say the Russian delegation. It's us. We're the ones who are concerned. You have then that option of add it, of throwing in, you know, a cause for concern. A cause of concern for us uh, is the situation in South Sudan, for example. Vizivat apispekoinest situatia of Yushnam Sudan. And you can tell that the speaker is really talking about for us. Whoever you know, the delegation. You can throw in that for us, or alternatively, you see that in fact the sort of the source of concern. It's not for the delegation, but uh, for somebody else. For for example, uh, the the ones who can are concerned are civilians in that in that region of South Sudan. Just for the, for the sake of argument, then you can always throw in a source of concern for the people in the region, or a source of concern for them. Okay, so that really is the safest way of approaching it, the a source of, a cause of, and then you can adjust it afterwards by throwing in the, the for whoever it may be to to give that um, connotation of who it applies to. And then, as I say, those are also the ones that are most likely to go with the, with the we. Now, another verb, another sort of sentence starter that's a bit like that, that tends to, that certainly tends to go into we is nabudaitsa. Nabudaitsa rost napriginia vietam regionia. Okay, so with that, you can pretty safely just say we. We can see a rise in tensions in the region. It's, you know, just the idea of seeing it, it's, it's the idea is that pretty much everyone can see it, right? 
it's very unlikely to apply to a third sort of a third party. Okay, it's something that's obvious. As soon as you see that, as soon as they use nabludayetsa, the implication is that what's being nabludayetsa uh, is is obvious. It's clear. So in that, for that reason, it's, you're pretty safe to just go with uh, you know we can see. Okay, so that's the first category. Now the second category of uh, of these uh, verbs at the start of sentences that we're going to look at are the ones that can pretty much be uh, rendered with a very boring but very useful just saying there have been there has been okay examples of this kind of verb are sentences that start with words like pastupayut price hodit and realizuitsa <clears throat> so here i'll give you some examples okay pastupayut sobshenya ob asvobozhdenye bayovikov okay pastupayut sobshenya so that just means okay reports have been coming in okay if you were to just be able to you know with the benefit of just being able to sit here and look at the sentence and give the sort of best english rendering we can just say reports have been coming in of uh, the release of uh, militants no, but now if you're in the moment if you're interpreting okay it's a different matter you haven't you haven't got that luxury but you know pastupayut it's a pretty general sort of word it just you can just basically say <coughs> there have been reports okay that's it you don't need to really reflect the idea of them coming in it's just that there have been or even just there are uh similarly with price hodit this is another so all these examples i've gleaned from these texts that we've do, been doing over the last few months i think that's the best way you find it's, it's very a good way of practicing just to look at all these examples and just decide in your own head how you would go about uh rendering them under actual working conditions under interpreting conditions and it really does help clarify a bit in your mind so here's another example происходит столкновение между группировками again now if you would just um look uh, render it now as a sort of site translation you would say that clashes have taken place between uh, the various groups but if you're at work and you heard that just suddenly you didn't have a text in front of you again you could just render it as there have been clashes between the various groups okay and then the final one realizuyutsa uh, so here's an example sentence realizuyutsa savmesnye projekty so again just here from a site translation we would say you know joint product joint projects have been implemented let's say carried out but again if you're at work uh you haven't perhaps got that luxury to wait uh for the for the noun you can still just say there have been joint projects okay it's okay you're dropping the implemented you can you can even throw it in there have been maybe you you, you hear okay you've said that there have been joint projects and you have that moment to throw in the implemented afterwards you can say there have been, there there have been joint projects implemented if you really want to capture uh the sense of that uh, uh realizuitsa now moving on to the third category now we're getting a bit harder now those are those verbs they come at the start of the sentence and your best approach to them is to try and uh turn them into nouns okay uh i'll give you so the, the examples i've got here for you i've got a uh probox 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 zamalchivatsya vaznikat planiritsa and we're just going to have a look at a few examples here and to to show you what i mean so the first example i've got for you is probuxovevayut kollektivnye mekanizmi okay so okay that basically means collective mechanisms are deadlocked collective mechanisms are, are paralyzed 
But okay, again, you hear that word suddenly thrown out at you, probuk sovivot, at the start of a sentence, and you're like, oh God, um, you need to, how can you turn this uh, into good English? And with this kind of verb, the best thing to try and do is to turn it into a noun. So you would say something along the lines of, there has been a stalemate or there has been deadlock in collective mechanisms. You need to have that skill when you're interpreting from Russian of turning uh, verbs into nouns. Another example for you. Uh, now, I think this was a sentence, this was something they said with regards to the situation uh, in Syria. And again, you just hear this verb meet from, right from the get-go coming out, it's a malchiva, it's a sluche. So I think they, they're talking, as if I recall right, it's about a report uh, about the situation in Syria. And um, basically the authors have ignored uh, the allegations, they haven't covered the allegations about uh, ISIS of ISIS persecuting local Arab populations. So what are you going to do with Zamalchivaitsa? How are you going to turn that into the noun? Okay, so you're going to say something along the lines of there is silence as to cases of persecution of the Arab population. Okay, that's one. So Zamalchivaitsa, you think, okay, turn it into a noun. So that gives you the option, you know, you can start the sentence with there is. That's often, you know, that's often... A, uh, a good um, a good way to address lots of these um, lots of these sentences. Just start off with the "there is" because that sounds natural uh, in English. And then, as I say, try and turn that uh, noun into uh, that verb into a noun. Uh, another example. So another example. Planirujete pravisti savishanje na urovnje glav gosudarstv. Okay, so that basically means uh, the, they're planning to hold uh, a meeting at the level of head of state. So that planirujetsa, the easiest way to address that is to say something along the lines of the plan is to, okay, the plan is to hold a meeting at the level of, uh, of heads of state, as opposed to, to waiting, you know, a meeting at level of heads of state is being planned you know, that's that's the you know you have that option there is always that option to wait but it's dangerous um the rest of the sentence can escape or that rather that that verb can escape from you if you do, I mean, if you lose that verb then then you're in trouble then you're in trouble so you want to really try and get that verb out of the way as soon as possible and then just be able to be able to follow the flow of the rest of the sentence I mean, you have to remember with these solutions, they're not going to sound, they're not going to sound great. They're not going to sound great English, Shakespeare-like English. But sometimes you, you, that can't be helped with Russian. Often in Russian, um, you just have to concentrate on making sure the meaning is still there. Even if the, if the English doesn't, if, even if the English sounds clunky, um, when interpreting from Russian, that is, it's inevitable that it's gonna, it, that the English is going to sound a bit a bit awkward. Now, moving on to category number four, okay, and this category is to do with the sort of solution of um, something that's still happening, okay. There are a lot of these cases when the Russians will launch into a sentence and the basic underlying meaning is that something is still happening. I will demonstrate. So these could be words, for example, these can be sentences uh, that start with verbs like astatsia, pradolzatsia, uh, sakhranyatsia. They're the most obvious, okay? And for example, I'll give you another example here. So one example might be astayatsa nerazrishionim vapros mandatia. Okay? So the idea of the idea here is so okay if we just as a, to translate it like this, uh, the issue of the mandate uh, remains unresolved. But again, you want to, if you're interpreting, you want to stay perhaps closer to the speaker. So what's the sort of what's a way you can try and get that when you hear the astayotsa? What's one thing that you can say? That one thing is still okay. 
uh, which would give you a sentence that would sound something like still unresolved is the issue of the mandate. Okay, again, doesn't sound great English, but it's okay. You can say it. That that, that you can say that in English. Still unresolved. Still unresolved is a question of the mandate. Uh, another example. Продолжается разграбление нетоносных месторождения. Okay, so with the so with the benefit of hindsight, just sitting here, we can see that you know if you were to do a written translation of this, the most natural sounding solution in English would be something along the lines of um, you know the the looting of the oil fields continues. But again, in the moment, we want to try and immediately we want to try and stay close and you know these statements I've taken uh, these examples from I think in general they were all statements that were delivered pretty quickly and you didn't really have much time um, to store things too long in the memory because it was a, it, it was a lot of these were dense statements with lots of specific points uh, and so you you know you, it was really important to stay close to the to the speaker. So again, when you hear that pradaljaitsa, it should immediately trigger the word trigger the word still. So we might say something like, uh, "There's still looting of the oil fields." Then maybe you can put in "going on." Even you could just stop it. There's still looting of the oil fields. If you have that option, you know, with that you can throw in you can throw in the verb in English afterwards if it becomes when it becomes clearer to you what the what the thrust of the sentence is. So again, Pradaljaitsa again should trigger the word still. And again similarly, okay, so with Sakranya uh, with Sakranyatsya. Here's an example. Sakranyaitsa praktika pritisnyenye mirnik grajdan. So again, sitting here in hindsight, the be the the most the most like for like um rendering for Sakhranyaitsa might be, you know, something has been maintained. So the practice of uh, persecution of civilians has been maintained. Um, that's often what Sakhran, that's for me, you know, when I hear Sakhranyayat, maintain tends to be the first word that comes comes to mind. But in a situation like this, when you just hear the verb comes out, coming out immediately, Sakhranyaitsa, again, that word still should be the first word to spring to mind. So you could say something along, just something along the lines of there's still the practice of persecuting civilians. Okay, so similar to as to what we would do with pradaljatsya. Uh, so um, with those three verbs in particular, statsya, pradaljatsya, sakranyatsya, the first word that should spring to mind is still. Now this also applies for another sort of subcategory. Uh, of these kinds of sentences, and those are the those sentences that begin with nie. Okay, that can be again when you, when you hear that immediate a sentence starting immediately with the nie and a verb that can sort of induce a bit of panic. It does it induces a bit of panic in me. So seriously, as I say, it's not just beginners, but it's people with uh, who've been working for. I've got over a decade of experience and it still scares me when I hear stand sentences starting like that. So again, I'll give you a couple of examples. So, не снижает активности ряд других формирования. Now, I think there are two ways you can go about this. Um, again, there's the one where you turn that снижает into a noun and you say, uh, there's been no drop. Again, you want Get that there hat that that the there is okay. There's been no drop uh, in the activities of a number of uh, armed groups. Another alternative is to go with what's almost the opposite. So you, you turn it into an affirmative. So here in the Russian, it's a negative. Nisnijayet. Okay. There's no drop. Perhaps with hindsight, we would say the activities of uh, a number of armed groups haven't uh, faded or whatever, haven't dropped off. So we turn Nisnijait into an affirmative. So what does, in other words, has not dropped, when they say it hasn't dropped off, that also means is still very much a factor. 
for example, it's still happening, okay? Those activities are still very much going on. In which case you could say something like still ongoing or still a factor are still ongoing are the activities of a number of armed groups. Still relevant are the activities of a number of armed groups. Once again, I stress, doesn't sound great English, but it does the job. And as I can say, that sometimes that's all you can ask. And uh, remember, your main client here are the, are the actual are the Russians. Okay, and as long as the Russians are happy with it, then you're probably going to be all right. And um, I think generally, when I've done, you know, when I've used when I use these tactics, the Russians tend to be fine with it. It does get the meaning across. Okay, so there's no drop off. Means the same as that they're still going on. You have to again. That's a very important uh, trick to be able to pull off. Uh, in Russian, turning these negatives into affirmatives. I guess the classic example of this, right, the most simple, straightforward example of that is when the Russians use недопускать. That's a, a, a the verb they use a lot, for example. Необходимо недопускать расизм. Okay, that just means, and the best, the most straightforward rendering of that in English is actually we must prevent racism. Okay. So another example, this is a very common one, this is a, a, a sentence, this is actually a f something that the Russians will frequently say Let's when it comes to the situation uh, in the Middle East, uh, Palestine, Israel, that sort of thing. And they will say, не потеряла свою актуальность наше предложение по проведению конференции Okay, so that means that the Russian proposal to hold a big conference on the, the Middle East peace process is still relevant. They often say, they all, you really do the, you say this a lot. They want to hold it, they always want to host it in Moscow. They always want to say, conferencia, blah, blah, blah. So again, when you hear that nipaterial svoyu aktualnost, which literally means something hasn't lost its relevance. If something hasn't lost its relevance, it means that it still is relevant. Okay? So you can start that sentence with by saying, still relevant is the Russian proposal to hold a conference in Moscow on the Middle East process. Or there is still there is still relevance in the mos, mos, in the, the Russian proposal, etc., etc. So you turn it into again the you turn the negative into the sort of like for like affirmative. That's a very again a very important skill to be able to, to pull off. Okay, so we're coming now to the, what I'm going to just have as my final uh, category of. Uh, verbs that tend to start sentences, and that is one specific verb I've gone for here, and that is заслуживать. Okay, this is one that, that they frequently will start sentences with. Uh, for example, now that заслуживать it can go two ways. Okay, uh, it can go in the way of something that's positive. Or it can go in the direction of uh, uh, something that's negative. So, for example, the Russian delegate might say, "Заслуживает высокую оценку работа спецпредставителя." So, which basically means the, um, the special rapporteur's work work um, has been uh, commendable. Okay. Again, you want to you you you're, you're you haven't perhaps got the time to save that has been commendable in your brain. Perhaps you're under a lot of pressure. Again, it all depends on how, you, how you're feeling at the time. If you're feeling very confident, maybe you can just save that. Maybe that's the, the, simple, the straightforward, most straightforward way is to just remember that has been commendable and then wait till you hear the, spits, the, the, the work of the special representative and then you attach the has been commendable at the end. But if you're under pressure, you want to as again, as I say, follow the, keep up with the speaker. And so the easiest way to do this when you hear the slogivet is you can say, uh, there's merit in, 
Okay, there's the, there's the, there's merit in the uh, special representative's work, or if you're worried you know, that the Russian delegate he's listening to the positive tone in your voice, you can say you know there's real merit uh, in the uh, special representative's work. So that is when the zaslujevet refers to something that's been uh, positive. Okay, but um, in Russian. Uh, doesn't you know when you hear merit as say in, in, in when you talk about merit in English it tends to point towards something that that's good or positive but um there's there are also just as many contexts where that as a slujevet can apply to something that's a, a, perhaps a negative phenomena where the, using the word merit uh, doesn't quite fit for example the Russians might say something along the lines of заслуживает пристальное внимание Совета положение дел в Идлибе. Okay, so the situation uh, in Idlib requires uh, permanent monitoring by the council. But how can you again uh, render that while going sticking with the speaker? So here it would probably be uh, inappropriate to say to merit, okay? Because again, merit seems, uh, you know, the, the connotation in English is that it's positive, but obviously the situation in Idlib, the chances are that things are a bit ropey there, things aren't great, and so you want, how can you uh, reflect that, but with giving it a sort of uh, negative connotation, and I think that the, the perhaps here you could say something along the line is, along the lines of there is a need to, there is a need to keep focused on the situation in Idlib. Um, so I think you have the, there is merit in, if you can tell it's heading for something good, a compliment, but if it's good, something bad, if something needs to be, you need something you need to keep your eye on closely because you're worried it might get out of control, then you probably be want to be going towards, there is a need to. Okay, so... Those are your five categories that I've sort of tried to uh, find for you, to establish for you for the purpose of this lesson, just to give you some rough pointers on how to deal with these constructions. Um, in conclusion, as I say, we're, I'm going to keep following this, and I'm going to probably make uh, get more examples, and I might be able to, I don't know, I might be able to come to some concrete rules at the end of it but i don't know look on the bright side this is the thing with russian language right um this is why it's uh once the artificial intelligence once the old ai rolls into town uh, it's going to take a hell of a lot longer i think for the artificial intelligence to uh, properly process russian than it will languages like french and spanish you know with french and spanish you got you know the syntax is what 80% 90% the same as in English uh, it's sort of going to be you know you can all you know you can almost do word for word when uh, when processing uh, statements from French into English uh, but with the Russian there's so, the, the, the syntax uh, the, just the constructions I think will make it much harder uh, for the for the AI to, uh, to process Russian uh, with with any ease. Um, so anyway, just uh, that little uh, digression. Yeah, just what happens, okay, if if everything goes to pot, if you've just, you have just you just lose it, okay? That verb, you, it's, the sentence starts off with that verb uh, and you've lost it, okay? Because again, you're looking at, in English, we, we look out for the subject. We're waiting for that first noun. Um, you want a sort of selection of little phrases that that you can put in after the noun that might yet save the day, for example, okay? Words like, uh, so ignore. Okay, remember we were talking about, remember I gave you the sentence, замалчивается случай притеснения арабского населения. Let's see, that, that, that. замалчивается has passed you by, then you have to get in, you get the noun, okay? Cases, you say, uh, cases of persecution of the Arab population 
And you need to finish it. You can't just leave it at that. You need a verb, okay? And then you can just throw in, have been ignored, okay? That ig ignore it will often uh, get you out of trouble. And a lot, there's a lot of expressions that basically just boil down to ignore. Or another example, another, another expression that might just save you is this idea of something still being relevant or still being a factor. For example, with that sentence we had earlier, you've lost that snijayat, okay? But you've, okay, you've got the activities of other armed groups are still a factor, are still happening. Something along, you know, something along those lines. Another tip is to follow the tone um, of, a, of, a, of a, a statement, okay? If, the, if it's like, um, if they're talking about things, positive things that are happening, and they're, for example, they're using realizujutsa, uh, whatever it is, mieri, or whatever, likvidati biednosti. If you're talking about uh, the government of that country, for example, the chances are that it's going to be positive. And if they're talking positively, they're probably talking about themselves, things that we've done, okay? So if you're wanting, if you're inclined to sort of throw in the subject immediately of we, you know, then one thing that will act as a bit of a signpost, if it is going to be we, is if they're talking about positive things, okay? So, if, you know, combating poverty, you probably are, guy, you know, that's likely to be how, what our guys are doing to combat poverty. However, if the speaker is talking about negative phenomena, um, then it's, the chances are it's going to be more like they, okay? I'll give you an example. Um, this was actually taken from a, the statement I did on Syria a long time back. Long time ago. Предпринимаются конкретные усилия по срыву выполнения резолюции Совбеза. Okay. Here, when he says предпринимаются, uh, you don't know, is it going to go into we or they? And it's important who the, uh, who the subject is here. And when you hear the word, okay, срыву выполнения, that sounds bad, right? The, the violating implementation. So the chances are it's going to be someone else. It's not going to be us. It's they. Um, so again, if, it, if it's a long laundry list of things that um, your foes are, have been doing, then the chances are it's going to go into they. So it's important that you follow the context of the statement. That, that can really help you. Okay, so I think we'll leave it there for now. That's probably, you know, quite a lot of information for you to process. And uh, as I say, uh, I am going to keep closer track of examples like this because, um, as I said, for me, this is one of the toughest aspects uh, when interpreting from Russian. There are a number of different as other things that pose major problems, but this is definitely one of them, you know, that... Uh, English native, you know, the native English speakers desire to hear immediately what the subject of the sentence is, and uh, so we do get flustered when we, when we hear these sentences that start with verbs. So, I'm going to keep track of that. I thought it was an interesting little exercise, just to, you know, just to put it on the table, just so you guys can have a think about it. And one of the best ways of, as I say, of practicing it is you when you, you look at statements, and you just sit down like this, and you look at these different examples, and you decide in your own mind. How would I best deal with this? How would I best render these um, sentences? And uh, you'll find just by doing that, that I think that will uh, enhance your skills uh, significantly. Anyway, if you found this episode useful, I hope you have, please do uh, smash the like button. Uh, please do subscribe uh, if you haven't done so already. Uh, follow me on the uh, Interpretation Station LinkedIn page. Share all the, share, share share the episodes with your friends and colleagues. And um, with that, as I say, it's been a pleasure. And all I'm going to say is that episode 66 of the Interpretation Station is adjourned. <laughs>